and stations us now one minute before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown one minute from mark one minute And stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown 30 seconds until hour number one from mark that was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with dr michael brown we'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before followed by a short one at five seconds have a great afternoon everybody We're going to tell you the truth, the real truth about Jews and the slave trade today. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome, friends, to our thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-3487-884 is the number to call. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, which means any Jewish-related question you have of any kind, Jewish-related, Israel-related, Hebrew-related, Messianic prophecy-related, Jewish background to New Testament-related, that is conspiracy theories against the Jews related. Any question like that, by all means, give me a call. And I, in particular, invite those who differ, those who have different perspectives, those who believe I'm wrong about Israel and the Jewish people as far as fulfillment of prophecy, those who differ with my assessment about contemporary anti-Semitism, those who believe I'm wrong about Jesus being the Jewish Messiah. We always invite you to call 866 866- Three, four, truth. Okay, <clears throat> some good news, and then we're going to get into a very serious and eye-opening topic. Uh, last week on the broadcast, quite unexpectedly, my guest Scott Volk said, hey, listen, I want to double any gift that comes in. Well, we don't get a lot of active gifts during radio. We don't use this as, as a fundraising device, but we do let folks know if you're watching on Facebook, there's a donate button. Just click on that. If you're watching on YouTube, under the, underneath the chat window, there's a dollar sign. Click on that and donate, and, the, and these gifts are greatly appreciated and help us. Well, Scott said I'll double anything that comes in. So over the show on Facebook, people send in like uh, $360 or $77, which is more than normally comes in through Facebook because, again, it's not, it, it's, that's our way to reach you and touch you. It's not a, a fundraising device. Uh, then Scott texted me afterwards and said, hey, listen, I want to give it a week and up to 5000 and he's been checking with me. Did you get it yet? Because I want to write you that check and double it for Jewish outreach. So we sent out an e-blast announcing it. And we're probably, I don't know, at this point, about 1,500 short of the goal. We've probably brought in about 3,500 thus far. Hard to say exactly. But if you'll stand with us today, your gift of 10 or 20 or 50 or $100, it'll get doubled. So today's the last day to do it. So would you do that if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube? Just click on Donate, the Donate button on Facebook or the dollar sign underneath YouTube. Click on that underneath the chat box. Or just go now to AskDrBrown.org. Click on Donate and designate Jewish ministry. So we got to the rest of the day to do it. Scott really wants to write that check. And, and by the way, I reminded him, because he, he loves to give. He's a real giver. I reminded him that Jesus said is quoted in Acts 20, it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive, right? So I told him, you're welcome for his generosity because <laughs> he gets blessed even more than we do. But that's to say you get blessed. You get blessed as you give. So would you do that? Join in, and it'll make a real difference. Okay, what is the real truth about the Jewish people and the slave trade? 
As we do our show each week, there's a live stream on Facebook, a live stream on YouTube. So along with people calling in, uh, comments are being posted. Now, sometimes I'll see them passing by in front of me on my screen, but for the most part, I don't see the comments, and I can't interact with them. In other words, if you throw questions up on there, I'm not able to interact with them during the show. But every so often, my staff will pull something up and put it to my attention. So I noticed someone named Maxwell posting and all these challenges and kind of taking over the, the thread last, last week on Facebook, and, and then he's saying, they won't answer. I'm trying to call in. They won't answer. I'm thinking, we don't discriminate against who, who we answer. The, the call screen, the only thing they know is that if you call within two weeks, then you're on a list not to, not to be brought on the air to give time to others, an opportunity to others to call. That's, that's the only thing. That's it. So no one is not answering your call because they don't like what you have to say. No, that's not the case. You may call in and want to talk about something that's contrary to the subject matter that day, and you'll be told to call in another day. But otherwise, no one was stopping. And then he said, they're not answering because I'm going to embarrass Dr. Brown on the air. So anyway, I noticed right at the end that he called in. So, so here's the call. This is what actually happened. I want to play this from last week. Maxwell, great. You're, I'm, you're going to embarrass me. They won't pick up. Dr. Brown knows me. I'd embarrass him. Maxwell, I have no clue who you are, but go ahead and embarrass me, please. You got, you got the listening world. Please, go for it. You don't remember me from the Noah question? You don't remember, you don't remember that? What well, anyway. I, I, I've, I I've been asked hundreds of thousands of questions, sir, over the years. But go ahead. All right. All right. I noticed that we're not live. That's the first thing I noticed, but that's okay. I'm still going to ask you. Maxwell, we are, we are live. I'm looking at okay. the clock. All you right. got a minute and a half before we go off the air, but we are live, sir. <laughs> so I don't know what world you're in, buddy, but let's. I want to hear from you. I want to know what you're thinking. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So I'm a student of history, and I know that the Jews um, were involved in the slave trade and a major part of the slave trade. False. We're talking about reparations. Totally false. What? 100% right, hold on, false. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Maxwell, that's false. Question. That's false. That's true. That's true. The Lewis Farrakhan, Farrakhan books have been demolished, yeah, destroyed, those refuted. Those Jews, Jews played a book, minor role Jews. in the slave trade. Jews played Stop a minor book. role in the slave trade. Stop it, Fact. Brown. Stop it. Well, I'll tell you what, Maxwell, you want to – here, here's the deal. When you speak ignorance, you embarrass yourself. When you hear, so, so tell you what, I posted my source from a Jewish source on your page on Facebook. <laughs> Maxwell, the things have been this, demolished. This, this, this is not a hack job. This is the straight truth for you. Okay. Now, can you answer my question? Okay. What part does, do Jewish people have to pay in reparations to black people? Well, I would say that if you look at black crime on Jews in recent years, which black is much higher than propaganda. Uh, are you, you, you're uh, uh, a Russian bot now? You, you just spread lies? <laughs> All right, so this is, I just want to give him a, a second to see. This is some of the nonsense we deal with. All right, so the problem is that many people believe this to be true. Many people have added this into the list of evil things that Jews do, and Jews played a dominant role in the slave trade. Now, what, what really popularized this was a three-volume series that was published without a specific author's name from Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan's organization, and Farrakhan being one of the most prominent anti-Semites in, in the modern world in, in America. And volume one was devoted to this. So, so this was the cover of, of the book, and it, it proclaimed this. It said, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews, volume one, <clears throat> and specifically the Jewish role in black slavery, the Jewish role in black slavery. I see that referenced all the time. I see it referenced in tweets. I see it referenced in quotes, popular media. And, and I'll show you how it spread in black circles and white circles. A few years ago, first major women's march, March on Washington, anti-Trump watch march, one of the main founders and organizers was Tamika Mallory. Tamika Mallory, a black woman. All right. And Tamika Mallory had previously referenced this here. Look at this story about Tamika Mallory. So this is going back again three years. She was involved with Women's March, one of the key initial founders of this march. And American Spectator did a story understanding the roots of Tamika Mallory's obsessive Jew hatred. And when you scroll down in the article to point number five, Tamika Mallory, Jew Hatred and Farrakhan, as Tablet Magazine reports, 
Mallory privately has blamed Jews for the slave trade that brought African Americans here. The allegation that Jews bear a special collective responsibility as exploiters of black and brown people and were proven to have been leaders of the American slave trade is remarkable for its ignorance, blind hatred, and bigotry against Jews. On the other hand, it's a core element of the Louis Farrakhan Jew hate narrative. Tamika Mallory is an integral part of that hate machine, too. She has imbibed at the well. All right, so here you have an example of a black leader who has taken in this Jew hatred and who believes these lies that Jews played a dominant role, a prominent role in the slave trade. And let's go over to the white side, a famous anti-Semite, David Duke, former Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, involved in the political scene in Louisiana. So what does David Duke say? David Duke has an article, How Long Will the Jewish Role in Slavery Be Hidden? And he's got this chart, Jewish control over American slavery. So here you've got a white anti-Semite, a black anti-Semite, and they're pointing to this same nonsense, the same alleged Jewish role. Now, <clears throat> I want you to hear this. This is from a book by Jewish historian Eli Faber. We're going to be quoting from it extensively in this broadcast. And in his book about Jews and the slave trade, where he, he sets the record straight, uh, he says this, and, he, and, and he's talking about Harvard professor, African-American, Henry Louis Gates. He writes, these views quickly attracted a following as Henry Louis Gates Jr., the chairperson of Harvard University's Afro-American Studies Department, and a, and a good friend of President Obama, by the way, noted with grave concern in 1992 in an essay in which he decried the rise of anti-Semitism among African-Americans, Gates described the Nation of Islam's publication as one that, quote, may well be one of the most influential books published in the black community in the last 12 months and wrote that its conclusions were, quote, in many circles increasingly, increasingly treated as damning historical fact. And he goes on to say this, among significant sectors of the black community, this brief that Jews were inordinately responsible for the enslavement of Africans has become a credo of a new philosophy of black South affirmation. Gates characterized the book, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, as, quote, the Bible of the new anti-Semitism. As such, the volume represented a new, if not wholly original, contribution to the corpus of anti-Semitic ideas, to the litany of Christ killer, well poisoner, usurer, unscrupulous businessman, ruthless banker, conspirator bent on world domination, and racial polluter, was now added the label of slave trader. The late 20th century thus bore witness to the creation of a new myth regarding Jewish malevolence, as well as Jewish responsibility for mankind's suffering. So the book that I was quoting from by Eli Faber, let me put the cover up for you, Jews, Slaves, and the Slave Trade, Setting the Record Straight, which is exactly what he does. Uh, I bought another book. These are, these are two of the most important. Uh, this one I bought physically. That one I, I got on Kindle to read. But another book that I have, uh, Saul Friedman, Jews and the American Slave Trade. Jews and the American Slave Trade, another book that sets the record straight, detailed scholarship. And I'm going to show you the fundamental error of the, the Farrakhan book. The, he didn't write it, but his team, The Secret Relations. We're going to set the record straight. We're going to cast out error by presenting the truth. So how did the fall affect humanity? Well, profoundly, deeply, in every way. We went from fellowship with God to separation from God. We went from spiritual life to spiritual death. We went from the potential of living forever to now having bodies that will decay and die. We went from trust to fear. It goes on and on. Everything negative that we see in the human race today murder and rape and war, everything that we see in terms of people butchering each other, in, in terms of hatred, in terms of bitterness, in terms of lust, in terms of greed, in terms of 
every wrong thing that's in the human race, all of that happened because of the fall. Look at what Paul wrote, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, he says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So every human being is born with a death sentence hanging over them. Every human, is, human being is born fallen, meaning that it is our nature to sin. Every human being is born as an object of wrath. Uh, ultimately, this is what we grow up to and become because this is in our very nature. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to lie, to disobey. This is part of our fallen human nature. So physical death is an outgrowth of it. Sickness, pain, disease, what we have in this world, all the sin of the world, and then spiritual separation from God, being in a spiritually dead state. That's what happened because of the fall. The good news is through the one man, Jesus, we can be forgiven, receive eternal life, and have more through Jesus on the other side of the cross than Adam and Eve had before the fall. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back to our Thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast. If you have a Jewish-related question, 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. So what is the truth about Jewish involvement in the slave trade? Now, interestingly, you have examples of Arab Islamic involvement in slave trade going into Africa and bringing slaves out. Oh, back in the 600s, documented as early as 641, something that was practiced in Islam with Arabs and Muslims for many, many centuries, and in some parts of the world still practiced to this day. So it's interesting when you have the nation of Islam trying to single out Jews when they must know about the historic Arab slash Muslim role in slave trade long before Jews or Christians were involved in it, and even ongoing to this day. Let's, let's put that aside, and let's say, hey, either way, guilt is guilt. Jewish responsibility is Jewish responsibility. And Eli Faber and other Jewish scholars would agree. So, so first, look at Faber's description of the horrors of the slave trade, just to, to jar us so we feel it again. He said, despite assiduous efforts by historians since Philip D. Curtin published his seminal study of the size of the slave trade in 1969, we shall probably never know, in all its grim and cruel enormity, how many men, women, and children on the content, continent of Africa were trapped in the net of the Atlantic slave trade, wrenched from their homes and their families, marched in chains to the coasts, and transported across the seas during an era that lasted well over three centuries. Millions were condemned to spend the remainder of their lives in servitude and to witness the enslavement of their children. Many more did not survive the Atlantic crossing, perishing instead on vessels swept by disease or from a profound depression that the historical record tells us frequently sees many of the captives in its grip. Still others died within a few years of arrival, toiling on the plantations and in the mines of Europe's colonies in the Western Hemisphere. So Faber paints a picture, drastic picture of the horrors of the slave trade. And, and all that is, they're just words. Who can imagine how horrible it was, how terrible it was, how evil it was? What kind of role did Jews play? And what's the, se what's the secret that is being covered up? That's what we really need to know. So I'm going to continue to quote from Faber, again, just a top scholar in the subject and a highly reliable book. This is what he says. That Jews participated in the slave trade, sometimes by investing in companies engaged in it, sometimes as the owners of slave ships, and that they owned slaves when they settled in the Americas, are matters that have been known from a substantial body of works produced by Jewish historians. In other words, there's no secret. This is nothing that's been covered up. This is nothing that's been hidden. This is nothing that the Jewish community hasn't talked about openly 
and documented even for a couple of centuries. And you can go to a standard Jewish reference book like Encyclopedia Judaica, dozens of volumes, and look up the lengthy article on slavery and the slave trade. It'll, it'll lay things out. There's, there's no secret to that. But here's the long and short of it. On the one hand, Jews were like everybody else. They participated in the slave trade, especially Jews in the South. And you have examples of rabbis preaching to justify the slave trade. And you have examples of rabbis being involved in the abolition movement, just like their Christian counterparts. You say, well, then Jews are like everybody else. Well, no, no, no. Here's the thing. The lie is that Jews played a disproportionate role in the slave trade. The reality is they played a very, very, very minor role. One reason being that very few Jews own plantations. So very few Jews overall would have slaves. Yeah, they had slaves like everybody else, but because of line of work and background and, and jobs they'd been allowed to have and not have through the centuries, you ended up with very few Jewish plantation owners. And the, the, the fatal flaw of the Nation of Islam's secret relationship between blacks and Jews that has been so devastating, ex devastatingly exposed and demolished for decades now, for anyone that cares to know the facts and the truth, <clears throat> the fact is that comparisons were not adequately done. In other words, this is a hypothetical. You might have a statement, every Jewish family in Charleston, South Carolina, owned slaves, or every Jewish plantation owner owned slaves. You know, there was one Jewish plantation owner. That was it. The others didn't have plantations. Or, yeah, Jews own slaves here and cumulatively, again, just numbers I'm, I'm making up to make a point here. You get all the data in the books. But say Jews owned uh, 400 slaves in this community, right, and the overall community had 30,000 slaves. So the comparisons aren't there to show you the minor role was played. So let's, let's read some more Faber. Let's see what he has to say. All right, just waiting for our clip to come up in front of me. Here we go. Knowledge that Jews had participated in slavery was not, however, restricted to a small circle of scholars writing esoteric monographs for a professional audience. Many more studies could be cited to demonstrate that Jewish historians have neither overlooked nor denied the fact that members of the Jewish faith participated in the institution of slavery. Insofar as Jewish historians were concerned, there never had been anything secret about the relationship between blacks and Jews during the era of slavery. Contrary to what the title of the tract that appeared in 1991 that indicted the Jewish people for their involvement in the enslavement of Africans implied. Okay, so what's the reality then? Let's, let's get to the summary. What's the reality here? So just a couple more slides from Faber as he lays this out. In recent years, Interest regarding the extent to which Jews participated in the institution of slavery in the Americas has stemmed from allegations that they predominated in the slave trade and that they owned slaves well in excess of their proportion among the white population. This study argues that they did neither. To the contrary, their participation in the slave trade and in the ownership of slaves was quite small. When compared with their non-Jewish contemporaries, their involvement was one that had little impact. These are the facts. This is history. Here is the, the article that Maxwell cited last week, posted on Facebook to say, you see, these are Jewish scholars who say this. I'm getting this from Jewish scholars. It's Jews and Negro slavery in the Old South, 1789 to 1865, address of the president, Bertram W. Korn, publications of the American Jewish Historical Society, volume 15, number three, March 1961, pages 151 to 201, published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Yes, that is a major study. I wonder if folks have actually read it. They cited, have they actually read it? Here, let, let me go on. This is, this is what the author, Korn, uh, dealt with in favor. It summarizes it. He identified Jewish slave traders in Curaçao in the late 17th century and Jamaica during the 18th century and still others in colonial Philadelphia, Newport, and Charleston. Later in the United States, Southern merchants, auctioneers, and commission agents who sold slaves included two leaders of the Jewish communities of Mobile and Columbia during the 1850s. For, quote, at no time did Southern Jews feel tainted by the slave trade. In other words, they were involved with it like everybody else. To provide perspective and balance, however, Korn noted the very article that Maxwell said proved his point and that other 
Others point to other anti-Semites point to is proving their point. He says this, at no point, uh, excuse me, to provide perspective and balance, however, Korn noted that the total activity of all Southern Jews engaged in the slave trade probably did not equal the turnover of the largest single non-Jewish firm which specialized in slaves, a statement he made in his earlier essay. So he has the article in Encyclopedia Judaica, and he says this, and this article, which is considered to be a very important article. When you actually read it, again, hear this, to provide perspective and balance. Korn noted that the total activity of all Southern Jews, all Southern Jews, total activity engaged in the slave trade, probably did not equal the turnover of the largest single non-Jewish firm which specialized in slaves. In other words, if you actually read the article, you cite the article, you throw it up on Facebook, you throw it up on social media, look, this proves my point, this is from a Jewish scholar, you read the article, and the Jewish scholar says, yeah, Jews were involved, here's this, we know this, no secret here, just repeating what's been known, summarizing it, putting it out. It's terrible that we participated at all. These are the realities. But the sum total... Everything that Jewish slave traders were involved with, and, and you could come up with similar data when you go to England and, and look at their involvement in the, the slave trade there, as these books that I reference get into by Friedman and Faber. So when you total up all the activity of the Jewish slave traders, it, it doesn't even amount to just one, one firm, one non-Jewish firm. And there were many, 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 many. So the bottom line, Jews, like other Americans, sinfully participated in the slave trade. And there were Jews also who protested against it and who were part of the abolition movement. But the Jewish involvement overall, one, because of small Jewish population overall, two, because of small Jewish ownership of plantations, it ended up being minimal. That is the reality. It is a bald-faced lie, a bald-faced lie demolished by facts that Jews played a disproportionate role in the American slave trade. Scholars have demolished it for years. If you love the truth, join me in exposing error and demolishing lies. Share the video. Let's get the word out. Truth will set people free from all kinds of lies. Oh, there's no excuse. No excuse for any Jewish participation in the slave trade, any more than Christian participation or human participation. It remains a sinful blight on human history. Problem is, basically every religion on one level or another and peoples from all over the world participated in it. It's our job to do what's right, to expose the errors of the past and do and live what is right today. 866-348-7884. We'll come back with your Jewish-related calls. So what about the black Hebrew Israelites, or as they sometimes call themselves, the Hebrew Israelites? Are they a dangerous cult? Oh, yes, absolutely. You might have some who are very mild in their views, who simply believe that as blacks, that they are the original descendants of Israel, and they preach salvation through Jesus like anyone else. Okay, that's fine. But the ones that you find on the street corners, the ones that you find aggressively putting forth their message, they are full of hostility. They are full of hatred. They are bigoted. They are Jew haters. In other words, someone like me, they claim that we are the manifestation of Satan, that the white man is the manifestation of Satan. Many of them do not preach the Jesus of the scripture in any real respect. They preach a cult figure, Yeshua, or whatever name they give to him. And they would say that basically all blacks are the original descendants of Israel. So are there black Jews? Yes, absolutely. Like there are white Jews. Are there black Israelites? Yes, just like there are white Israelites. But are all blacks the descendants of the people of Israel? No, of course not. Categorically not. That is not so. That's part of their false teaching. Many of them are thoroughly legalistic in their teaching and then add in other customs. They are a cult. They are dangerous. They're spreading. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. He had this concern. He said this, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. 
there is something happening now with the Hebrew Israelites, with the black Hebrew Israelites, especially in inner cities, especially in different uh, African-American communities in America, where they are gaining more and more following. But because they bring people into bondage, not freedom, because they practice hate and promote hate rather than love, because they preach another Jesus, when we bring the real message of truth and liberty and salvation through the Messiah, not through a white Jesus, but through the biblical Messiah, they'll find liberty. Michael Brown here. I want to invite you to join me on our next Israel trip. Oh yeah, this one has been a saga. We had to delay it because of the coronavirus, but we are so excited to be going back to Israel the beginning of March 2021. It is the trip of a lifetime. Great hotels, great food, but that's not where you're going to Israel. You're going to Israel for the tour of a lifetime. I mean, the Bible will come alive to you. Just think of being on Mount Carmel where Elijah called on fire from heaven. We look down at, at Har Megiddo, Armageddon, and, and we talk about the fire of God and the end of the world. I, I mean, it's an incredible time. And then every night I do something with the tour group. We do a teaching, we pray together, you join me for a radio show. So it really is an amazing and special time. Great tour guide, great time with everyone together on the bus. So Join us. We have seats available. Sign up. Go to AskDrBrown.org to find out more. Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I hope you can join us in Israel next year. Yeah, it's what? It's six months out. Six months out. March. Well, end of February, early March 2021. Go to the website, sdrbrown.org. Right up there on the homepage, you'll find the info. Okay. And just a quick reminder, just a quick reminder. We're going to go to the phones. Last week, my friend Scott Volk on the air, right, up, right about this time, a few minutes after this, surprised me, surprised himself by saying, hey, any donations that come in directly through the show, people give on Facebook, et cetera, I'm going to double that. And we got a few hundred dollars in that day because we don't normally get donations on Facebook because that's, that's just our means to be a voice to you. And YouTube limited, you know, normally donations come through email and responses like that. Anyway, anyway, uh, he then texted me after the show and said, hey, listen, Mike, anything up to 5,000 that comes in, I'm going to double I'm going to double that for Jewish outreach, and you have a week to get it. So we just sent out an email today. We probably got in, I don't know, six, $700 um, from last week, but sent out an email, got, <laughs> excuse me, uh, a few thousand more. So I think right now we probably need about 1000 1500 somewhere around there to get it doubled. So your gift of $10 becomes 20 your gift of 50 becomes 100 your gift of 100 becomes 200 so if you're able to stand well, it's just a, it's a neat opportunity to have funds double for Jewish outreach, Jewish ministry. Just on Facebook, click on Donate, give whatever you can, you feel prompted to. YouTube, the dollar sign beneath the chat window, and otherwise just go to askdrbrown.org, click Donate, and designate Jewish ministry. And your gift today will be doubled. Last day to take advantage of this. 866-348-7884. Let's go to the phones, and we'll start with Luke in Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. So, um, and so here, I guess I have a, it's kind of a long question, but I'll try to we'll get to it. I, I always try to explain that, and like Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, but then someone explained to me that Messiah simply means anointed one. As, some, as a person who occasionally emerges among the Jewish people to restore order or liberate them. And he actually said that by that definition, King Cyrus would technically be considered a messiah. And so I was kind of baffled by that description. Yeah. And so I guess the best way to cl clarify the question is, like, if, say I don't know anything about Judaism or Christianity or human history, what, like, what, what would be the best way to describe the messiah and why should I care? Yeah, so the first thing is what that person did was a complete smokescreen, and they probably know it well. In other words, the, the Hebrew word Mashiach is used for numerous people in the Old Testament. It's used for King Saul. It's used for King David. It's used, um, in theory, for any, any king of, of Israel or Judah. Cyrus in Isaiah 45 strikingly is called the Mashiach. Uh, the high priest was HaKohena Mashiach, the anointed high priest. So it was someone who was anointed for service or raised up for particular service. 
and, and the words used for many different people in the Hebrew Bible. But Judaism then develops the idea of the Messiah. And whoever you spoke with, if they knew enough to say the first part, they knew the second part. It's not just any anointed person. In Jewish tradition, it, it, this becomes a very, very clearly developed idea that there will be a son of David, so in the royal line of David, who will rule and reign as king, that Jewish tradition, because of their emphasis on rabbis and learning, Jewish tradition develops him into an image of a, of a great teacher and rabbi. So he will lead the Jewish nation in obedience to God, observing the Torah. He will fight the enemies of the Lord. He will regather the exiles. He will rebuild the temple. He will establish God's kingdom on the earth. That's what they're expecting the Messiah to do, to be a human being anointed by God who will be from the line of David and will do all the things I mentioned. I mean, it's even very specifically laid out in Jewish law how to recognize him. So this is over the centuries what Judaism developed. So what we are expecting Jesus to do when he returns, to destroy the wicked, to establish God's kingdom on the earth, to bring about that era of universal peace and righteousness where, where nations beat their swords into plowshares, etc. That's what Jewish people are expecting the Messiah to do when he's revealed. So why should it matter? Because if we want to see God's kingdom on the earth, if we want to see an end to war, if we want to see universal peace, where the whole world worships God, we need the Messiah. Jews would say, well, that proves Jesus isn't the Messiah because he didn't do that. We would say, no, Jews have a, a partial understanding of Messiah. First, he must come and die for our sins and be a priestly redeemer. He will return and do the rest. So <clears throat> that's the simplest way to look at it. If you want to get more background info, get my book, 60 Questions Christians Ask About Jewish Beliefs and Practices. 60 Questions Christians Ask About Jewish Beliefs and practices, and we go through the various Jewish concepts of Messiah and many other things as well. All right. All right. Great. And, and I guess, and just, just to add, and just to add to that, it, it, and because it's very important, to the, it's also important to people who are non-Jews as well, because of the, what Jesus did. Yes. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And and uh, for for a Jewish person, when the Messiah comes, then the nations will be instructed and follow the ways of the Lord. Uh, our point would be, according to the prophetic scriptures, the Messiah will first be rejected by the people of Israel. The message will go to the whole world, and then the Jewish people will embrace him. So it's a both and historically. And without the Messiah, we would emphasize that there, there is no salvation, there is no redemption, that he is God's agent of redemption. Hey, Luke, thanks for asking. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yep. 866-34-TRUTH. So again, I don't, I don't get to, uh, to see comments unless they're especially posted. But this is, friends, this is what we deal with. When we just go through fact, 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 information, here's someone named Victor. This man is white supremacist and using propaganda. White supremacy is an ideology and a belief system wrapped in rest in Christianity. The white supremacists are honestly scared because they feel they're losing their grip on power and fear now drives their every instinct. It's pointless trying to reason with the ignorant and narrow-minded white supremacists. Okay, so, so friends, this uh, Christianity was the main ideology used to enslave and justify slavery. Christianity was one of many things, a, a misinterpretation, a blatant 1,000% misinterpretation of Christianity was used as a justification for slavery. And it was Christians who fought and died to free the slaves. And it was Christians who led the abolition movement. But you see, it's someone like Victor, what pains me is whether it's just blind hatred or giving over to a spirit of deception or believing outright lies for lack of pursuit of truth, that there's that level of blindness. In other words, you could show two plus two equals four. No, that's white supremacy. You could show the alphabet is A, B, C. No, 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 that's just the way the ruling class has put it, that, that there's no reasoning. And then we're told we're the ones that are unreasonable. Victor, pick up the phone and call with your data. Pick up the phone and refute the factual data that I have presented here. Pick up the phone and call us, 866-34-TRUTH. Did I hurt your feeling by speaking the truth about your false Christianity, your brainwashed, ignorant blacks with low esteem and lack self lack self respect to buy into? Again, it's this is and, and look, friends, I specifically quoted David Duke as well as Tamika Mallory 
to say there's anti-Semitism in white circles and black circles, okay? And historically, historically, it's been white anti-Semitism that has been so terribly destructive, all right? Hitler, okay, need I say more? Stalin, need I say more in terms of their Jew hatred? So we understand this is a universal sinful disease, but what is just utterly remarkable is the extraordinary level of ignorance. No, no concept of Christianity spreading through the, content, the continent of Africa in incredible ways. And countries that were dominant Islam now turning more and more and more to Jesus. And, and blacks coming into liberty in the sun. And these blacks now going from Nigeria and other countries to preach the gospel around the world. Some of the greatest students we had in our ministry school, some of the finest Christians I know are black African Christians living in Africa, doing an incredible job. But you have this type of blindness, ignorance, that's, that's what hurts me is that people are blind. What hurts me is that Jesus the Jew, who is not black or white, that Jesus the Jew died for this man's sin to set him free, and he's so blinded either by hatred or ignorance or what he's lived through in society that he can't see the truth that can deliver him. That's what pains me. That's what pains me. All right, back to the phones. Let's go to Ron in Ontario, Canada. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Uh, hi, Dr. Brown. Uh, hey, man. Wow, has, has this been a heavy subject? Yeah. Um, I want to get to my question in a moment, but Dr. Brown, weren't there rabbis, New York rabbis, two or three or four, whatever, who, who were with Martin Luther King from the beginning back in, what, 64, 65, before the Selma Bridge crossed over? Weren't they involved? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're prominent. Then? Jews were prominently involved. We've seared this many times uh, in the civil rights movement. They felt that they were their brothers, that they felt that they could relate to the oppression of the blacks, that they were both nations of liberated slaves that Jews had been hated around the world simply because of their faith, that blacks had been hated around the world simply because of their skin color, and you know, one race, one religion, and they, they felt they could relate. One of the most famous pictures from the civil rights era is Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of the great Jewish thinkers of the yeah, 20th yeah, century yeah. from Jewish Theological Seminary, walking arm in arm with Martin Luther King. Yeah, Jews yeah. Jews were prominently involved. There was a you know rabbi spoke right before King at the March on Washington, a, a white rabbi. Uh, tragically, things have, have really degenerated in black Jewish relationship in recent decades, and I'm not ascribing blame to either side. It's just happened. But absolutely, there was there was deep union then in those early days. So, what part of truth does Farrakhan not get? Yeah, well, here's here's the deal. When you I mean, are, what, what, I mean, what, come on, Doctor Brown. Yeah, look, here's I mean, here's the thing to look at, here. and he's Farrakhan is is also a man for whom Jesus died, and a man that's done tremendous damage with his lies and misinformation, especially in in influencing many blacks to 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 look to Islam or the specific brand of the nation of Islam. But again, if if you just want to look at guilt, if you just want to look at history, then Islam has a, a long, ongoing history with slavery, uh, Arabs going into Africa and taking slaves, going back into the seventh century. So going way, way before Portugal and Spain and others began with their horrific acts. So again, no justification. Pointing to someone else does not justify. But if you want to point a finger of something that's longest and still ongoing, then point to the Islamic role in slave trade. All right, be right back with your question. Is there such a thing as Jewish birthright? When it comes to the land, there are these birthright tours and, and Jewish young people go on these. What's it talking about? All right. Since we understand that Israel is the ancient homeland of the Jewish people and the only homeland on the planet that God gave to the Jewish people as a lasting homeland, and since the restoration of Israel as a Jewish homeland in 1948 
remains now a very, very important issue for Jews around the world. There are now more Jews living in Israel, say, than living in America. And just about as many Jews living in Israel as in, in all the rest of the world combined, this has not happened for millennia to, to have this situation. So, under the law of return, any Jew, if you have a Jewish mother, you can return to Israel and get citizenship. Now, they'll, they'll say, well, if you haven't converted to another religion, then they'll claim Jewish followers of Jesus have, and the religious Jews will try to keep us out. But otherwise, the understanding is if you're a Jew, right? So by rabbinic Judaism, if your mother's Jewish, if you're a Jew, then you have a birthright and the right to return to the land and live there and grant, get citizenship. And there's a really interesting verse in Psalm 87, verse 5. It says this, of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her and the Most High himself shall establish her. So even saying there's something special if you were born in Jerusalem, there's something special about that. And, and it was the chosen city and where God would reveal himself. But for Jews worldwide, the concept is if you're born a Jew, then you have the Jewish birthright, the right to return and get citizenship in the land of Israel. It's The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. <laughs> Welcome back to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I'm going to get back to Ron in Canada in a moment. But, you know, over the years, we have demolished the lives of black Hebrew Israelites. And when we've posted factually, just looking at, say, a key scripture, 99% of the comments are just, you Edomite devil, you Edomite liar. In other words, nothing dealing with the facts, nothing dealing with the substance, just an irrational attack. Just very, very simple, an irrational attack. I, I, I talked about Jesus, white Jesus, black Jesus, Jewish Jesus. You can, you can search for that on our YouTube channel or on, my, uh, on our, our homepage, sdrbrown.org. But the bottom line is, no, Jesus was not a black African. No, he's not a white Caucasian. He's a Middle Eastern Jew. You see people in like Egypt today would have looked very similar to that. One, one factual statement we have from well, within 100 years of the time of Jesus, uh, a, a Jewish rabbi in Israel, saying that Jews are not like the Germans, Caucasian, white. They're, they're talking about leprosy and skin disease and things like that. And they're talking about skin color. Not like the Ethiopians, but more like boxwood, which is a light brown color. So we're talking facts, talking about information here not what you think, what I think. So I just want to urge people, stop thinking with your emotions. Stop thinking just because of brainwashing information you've had from any side, all right? And go back and study because the truth will set you free. All right, so Ron, on a different note, you're a question, sir. Okay, thanks, Dr. Brown. Um, yeah, I'm involved in a Bible study. And I just wanted to read a sentence here, um, and I just wanted your comment on it. It says, Messianic Judaism does believe in a coming rapture, so to speak. The Torah and the prophets speak of it frequently, and it appears in this Torah portion. I wanted to ask you, where in the Torah, if there is something in the Torah, that it alludes, insinuates, and talks about this upcoming rapture, is there any credence to that? Uh, no, sir. The only thing they could potentially try to argue is that God took Noah and his family out during the flood, but he didn't. He, he gave them a way to get through the flood. They would argue that Lot was and his family was taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the, the fire fell. Of course, he's just moved nearby. He's not right. He just moved nearby, given a place of refuge where the wrath is poured out. We would counter that by saying, "Hey, just just look at um, just look at 
uh, Exodus where the plagues on Egypt uh, fell, but then they didn't touch Israel. Israel wasn't taken out. They were just protected. So no, there's no, there's no emphasis or reference to of any kind to a rapture anywhere in the Torah. Of course, I don't find it anywhere in the Bible. Does it reference the Torah portion specifically? No. Yeah, if, if, no. You, if you spot it, just, just shoot, us, shoot us a note. But uh, no. I, uh, you're familiar with FFOZ. I, I know Ryan worked for you for yes, some time. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, this is a Bible study I've been taking with FFOZ for the last couple of years, and it's called Shadows of the Messiah. And he gets into this stuff, and I don't know. It's overwhelming to me. It's well, just, yeah, just well, step back. You want to be edified and help. Not everything, you know, some things help one person, and it's not another's cup of tea. But ask Ryan specifically where the rapture is is allegedly referenced so hey ron thank you for the call by the way I, I love it i love it here's what's happening now in our in our youtube chat as our team is as filling me in it's it, i i love it all the anti-semitic lies and garbage are coming to the surface it's like you turn the light on and suddenly you know to, to use an analogy i'm not calling these people roaches but to use an analogy that you turn the, the lights on and roaches were suddenly they go scattering everywhere and they, they get revealed. So here, or, or conversely, use this image, you, you turn the light on at night and all the bugs come flying to it. Now, I'm not calling these people bugs. I'm not calling these people roaches. I am not calling anti-Semites bugs or roaches. I'm using an analogy. That the moment we shine the light on the lies of Farrakhan, that the moment we shine the light on, on the, the lies of anti-Semitism, that the moment we shine the light on black lies and white lies against the Jewish people, the anti-Semites come flying and now filling our YouTube chat with all kinds of lies, nonsense, garbage, and in keeping with the pattern, not one of them has the guts to call. <clears throat> you got time to sit? You're listening? You're watching? I'm looking. We have phone lines open. We have phone lines open. Not one of you has the guts to call. Isn't that interesting? But what I love is, is the things get crazier and crazier. <laughs> I'm a Frankist. They get crazier and crazier. And it just reveals the darkness. It reveals the error. So here's the deal. We're going to keep shining the light. And friends, as you give, as you give and help us, you help us shine the light and expose the error. Yeah, why did you, Ashkenazi persecute all over Jewish tribes? Yeah, just <clears throat> why not call in with your questions? Tell you what, tell you what, going to make life easy for you. Going to make life easy. 20 minutes from now, 20 minutes from now, we're going to be on YouTube exclusively, so not, not on radio, not on Facebook. We're going to be exclusively on YouTube in 20 minutes, and I'm going to be interacting just with YouTube questions. So all the anti-Semites, Jew haters, liars, conspirators, deceived ones, yes, from my perspective, you're deceived and you're lying. I'll interact with you then during the YouTube chat. Let's talk facts and information. If for some reason you can't, maybe you're in another part of the world, you can't call in now. Or on your job, you can type something, but you can't call. Wonderful. 20 minutes from now, 4.15 Eastern time, all the anti-Semites, Jew haters, conspiratorial theorists, join us and I will present truth to refute, rebut, demolish your error. Challenge me based on facts. How's that? Ask Dr. Brown on YouTube 20 minutes from now. Okay, back to uh, Cary, North Carolina. Greg, what's your question, sir? Hey, I was just wondering um, if you were familiar with Lon Solomon. Sure. I mean, we're not we're not friends, Uh I imagine he knows of me, but I've known of him and, you know, well-known pastor in the uh, Maryland, Virginia area for many, many years and a Jewish believer in Jesus. Yeah. Okay. I, did, I, I wasn't sure because I've listened to him quite frequently, and I didn't know if, if he was still currently um, doing the pastoring the church or not. I didn't know what his current status was or anything. Yeah, honestly, I mean, I'll, I'll type in his name here. I haven't followed his ministry. Again, I, I never visited his church. Lon Solomon Ministries, president and founder of Lon Solomon Ministries. 
Yeah, it looks like he's still active. And uh, let's see, he's got a 30-minute radio broadcast on 650 stations around the U.S. That's a lot more stations than I'm on. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think active. His, his testimony, he's known as a, as a Jewish man who's come to faith in Jesus and is pastoring a Christian church and doing Christian ministry. He's not so much involved in Messianic Jewish ministry or congregations or apologetics in that respect, but as a fine ministry as a teacher and preacher of the Word. Hey, thanks for, yeah. thanks for asking. All right, thank you. Sure yeah. thing. All right, 866 Three, four, truth. All right, on the Truth Network also. There you go. So on our same network here. Uh, all right, our buddy Eddie in New Haven, Connecticut. What's your question, sir? Dr. Brown, I knew you had a little opening, Jerry, so let me call you quick. Yeah. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, if everyone knows basically if my people are called by my name, would humble yeah. themselves, turn from their wicked ways. Is that still valid today, or was that like a temporary promise of God? All right, so it's an always principle. So... In other words, if the people of Israel did that today in Israel, it would draw a divine response of mercy and forgiveness. You say, how does it apply to America today? Well, the general principle would be if, if any nation would turn to God in repentance and ask for mercy, just like the people of Nineveh did in Jonah's day, God would have mercy. Proverbs 14.34 says that righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. But specifically, what we can do is, is as believers within America, we can do the repenting. In, in other words, this is not specifically a promise to America. It was a promise to ancient Israel, and it's an ongoing promise that would apply to, to the Jewish people today. But what we can do as tens of millions, maybe 70, 80, 90 million Americans who profess to be followers of Jesus Yeshua, if we will repent, if we will cry out, if, if we will ask for mercy— if we will say, God, we have sinned, we are guilty, have mercy on our land, the place where we live, it can be applied. So it's a secondary application because my people call by my name, my nation, you, that's, that would be as if America was Israel. So that's not the case. But as believers within the nation, we can do the repenting. At the very least, it can apply to us as believers, but our petition is for the land as a whole. So the principle of Jeremiah 29, that when you are in exile, pray for the well-being of the city as, as it prospers, you will prosper. So here in reverse way, we're asking for mercy. And as we repent, we're asking God to have mercy on the land as a whole. Hey, Eddie, thanks for the question. We are out of time, but 15 minutes from now, you can join us on YouTube. So do that, okay? 15 minutes from now, ASK DR Brown on YouTube. All the anti Semites, Jew haters, conspiracy theorists, you're welcome back. Let us have it out. Fact versus fiction. <laughs>